Here's a story, and it's true. When I was about 10 years old, my father, his business was doing well. Uh, he's an engineer, and he opened up an office in Nevada. And being from central Pennsylvania and never really having been out west, myself and my two older brothers, uh, my dad and mom decided to take us on a family trip. So we flew out to Carson City, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, is where the office was. But in that trip, of which we made a adventure out of it, if you will, we ended up in Reno, Nevada, which if you've never been is not unlike Las Vegas, not nearly on that level, at least at the time in my memory, but plenty of of casinos and saturated with all kinds of fun blinking and glowing externally stimulating lights. So after I believe this this trip was probably I want to say a week maybe more we ended up being in Nevada. My parents did a wonderful job of entertaining us for the most part. Now again I'm about I want to say 10 so my brothers uh, are both a year older around 11 maybe 10 and 11 or 11 and 12 mid 90s. We, as I can imagine, retrospectively, were probably uh, somewhat burdensome to parents who themselves had never been to Reno or Las Vegas, I believe. So, towards the end of this trip, my parents were quite ready, chafing at the bit to spend some time losing money in the casino. And we were staying at a hotel... I believe it was the Silver Legacy. Someone can fact check whether or not that's even in Reno. But I believe that's what it was called. And in the hotel, uh, in every hotel, pretty much in every building, there was a casino. And uh, my parents were, I'm sure, relieved to find that in this hotel slash casino, there was also an arcade. So they themselves, having giant buckets of quarters for the slot machines, hooked us up, turned us loose in the uh, arcade and said, we'll come get you in a while. Now, this isn't bad parenting. This was, again, the mid-90s. This wasn't unusual. You may not leave your 10 and 11-year-old kids alone in a, a casino arcade anymore, but it really wasn't that weird in defense of my parents. Plus, I'm sure it was also extraordinarily brutal to deal with us remembering myself how brutal it could be to be uh, in close confinement with my bros. We get along well now, for the most part. Anyway, we go to the arcade, we're playing games, we're being kids, we're being boys, and all of a sudden, one of my brothers, he kind of turns to us, God knows what game we were playing, and says... Isn't that the guy from Mrs. Doubtfire? And uh, that's because that's how little boys talk, right? And it was. Uh, We didn't know his name at the time, but we knew Mrs. Doubtfire, the movie, and it was Robin Williams, again, in retrospect. We didn't know that, but we recognized him immediately, and he was playing a game in the arcade, and it was pretty much just the three of us and him, and maybe 20 or so odd unused machines. So we're kind of starstruck, and none of us have the balls to really talk to him, so we work up our nerve, and we're kind of, you know, chattering amongst ourselves. He was a bit of a distance away. I don't think he even noticed us at first. So finally, we're like, all right, yeah, I mean, we got to go talk to him. So the three of us walk over there, Now, Robin Williams was not a tall guy. I mean, quite short, actually, I believe. But to us, he was a grown man. We were little boys. He he was larger than life in more ways than one. But physically, we were very intimidated. So we kind of uh, sack up and go over there. And and one of us, uh, probably my one brother who noticed him, says, uh, Excuse me, are you Mrs. Doubtfire? And he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt and has glasses on and looks down at us and we're terrified but also excited. And he's just super chill like, yeah, thanks for recognizing. What's up, guys? Stops playing his game, right? So he probably lost his his Pac-Man streak he had going on or whatever. He didn't give a shit. He just started chatting with us uh, and not in kind of the manic performance way you see him do sometimes, but very calm and reserved and, you know, asking us like, yeah, so clearly you've seen the movie and like, where are you guys from? Whatever. It was awesome. Like we were the only people in the world. Like he wasn't. Now, again, I looked back, I believe he was there shooting a movie. Uh, Father's Day was released in 97 and shot in Reno. So my, my sleuthing leads me to believe that's the movie he was filming with him and and Billy Crystal and whatnot. But again, I would later learn Robin Williams was known for just like kind of being the man and 
being really respectful of his fans. He's talking to us. Well, my dad comes by the arcade. Not sure if he noticed us talking to Robin Williams or us talking to some guy or it was just chance. But of course, he knew who Robin Williams was. So my dad was was in my memory quite respectful and said, hey, like, I know you're famous. You probably get this all the time. I don't want to bother you, and I'm sure you're here working and trying to chill, especially if you're in an arcade, but uh, if you don't mind me asking, like, what is that like that you're here and trying to just probably take a break and people, you know, here we are in your face. And Robin Williams, I remember this vividly, said, no, sir, uh, I love my fans. They're the reason I'm famous. And he said, I'm, I'll be honest with you. He said, if, when people start to notice me and, and the crowd starts growing and the you know girls start screaming or whatever, I'm going to leave. And please don't take it personally, but I'm going to leave when that happens. But I'm happy to stand here and talk to you guys until it does, which was awesome. And I remember being at 10 years old, even not fully appreciating what that might have, you know, must have been like for him to just kind of have to cut off his break to deal with fans, not even really fans, but just people who recognized him. It's not like we were well-versed in his, you know, oeuvre, uh, my dad even, but but he was just so nice and calm, not manic, but not uh, no like little under the breath kind of, you know, you can tell even as a kid when someone doesn't want to deal with you. He was not like that. And he talked to us, he signed autographs for all of us, all four of us on a notepad. And then a few minutes later, not to, to knock screaming women or fangirls or whatever, as my brothers and I we went up to him first, but people started to notice him and he said hi to them and thank you. And then he kind of looked at us and said, all right, guys, like, thanks for saying hi, but now's when I'm going to go. And off he went and we never saw him again. It wouldn't be until much, much later, a few, uh, a few years ago in my life. Now I would learn he was uh, bipolar. Robin Williams was bipolar and I beca became not because of that, but through a series of YouTube black holes and various movies. Uh, one, I think, for everybody is Goodwill Hunting when they started to realize just how talented he was. But he was bipolar and also dealing, apparently, towards the end of his life with a pretty intense depressive spell and uh, ultimately committed suicide. And myself being bipolar, um, though I hadn't really thought too hard about that, I remembered when I learned the day uh, that he died when it was in the news that I had actually met him and how he was. And I remember thinking at the time as a kid that to make a mental note, if I ever became famous or the kind of person people would notice, no matter what I was doing, if I was taking a break or frustrated with my personal or professional life, that not that that's how I would be, but that that's how I should be.